Bonjour, euh, je suis ravie d'être là avec des panélistes de qualité pour euh, discuter de l'autonomisation économique des femmes. If you want to uh, follow the debate in English, uh, you have to follow Canal 9 and French, it's Canal 10. So maybe we're going to switch to English to accommodate uh, the common language of the panelists. Um, we know that uh, when women access decent economic opportunities, it sets uh, off a, a virtuous cycle that improves gender equality, reduces poverty and vulnerability, makes a tremendous impact to economies as entrepreneurs, employee employers. We know that some progress have been made in the last 20 years uh, with more women educated and participating in the labor market. However, women are still overrepresented in unsecure low wages jobs. Um, women are still underrepresented in top positions and decision making jobs. Major gender gaps still exist and the wage gap is still penetrating as does discrimination in the workplace. So if we don't uh, speed up, it will take another 108 years to close the gender gap. And we know that uh, the economist is losing 28 trillion uh, dollars every year. Because we don't want to wait for another 108 years, uh, we have uh, gathered um, great panelists uh, today to discuss what we can improve the situation. So let me introduce briefly uh, our panelists. So FG Ukri, uh, you are a managing partner at Allen & Aubry, a law firm in Paris. And you are specialized in financial service regulation. And uh, you're going to talk uh, about women and finance and law. Um, Yeni uh, White, uh, you are director of the White Institute, uh, which aims is to facilitate dialogue and understanding between the Islamic world and the West. And you are a former journalist. Um, Niren Ben Goa, you are the founder of uh, Le Comité Oni Femme en France, and you are the general delegate of La Fondation Chanel. Um, the aim of the foundation is to promote uh, new strategies uh, for um, women empowerment. And uh, Marietta Jagger, uh, you are a diplomat by training in Slovenia and you are currently Deputy Director General at the EU Commission at the Business Desk Court, and you're going to talk about the Gender Action Act. So if you allow me to, to start, um, Gabriel Chanel said, if you were born without wings, do nothing to prevent them growing. But in many countries, the question is more how can we let them grow? So what does it mean to empower women when the society for various reasons, cultural, religious, social, denies any social value of rights for women? And uh, we will consider as well what are the main factors preventing women participation in the labor market. When you know that, for example, in the world, uh, in 18 countries still, husband can legally forbid a wife to work. And in 31 countries around the world, uh, only men can be head of the household. So maybe we're going to start with, um, with uh, Yeni White. So my question is, what can we do when uh, cultural, social, and religious factors prevent women to have any economic growth. Thank you, Pam. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, for all the wonderful, enlightened women in the room and the 
two brave men who are here present. I thought, Karen, that you, uh, you were going to give the first uh, uh, chance to speak at our fellow gentlemen here, you know, being uh, now that we have a majority of women in the panel, then you will give the, uh, the first chance to men um, as a sign of gender equality. <laughs> Uh, uh, I think what you've said is uh, correct, uh, that uh, you know, with all the problems that we face in this world, that there's uh, gender inequality and that, uh, that has, it has the direct consequences, of course, of uh, financial loss to the global economy because for that 28 trillion potential gain financially is lost because women are not given access to uh, labor force. Uh, and we also have uh, direct consequences of how uh, if women are not being given a chance to explore their uh, potential, then we have a uh, persuasive uh, uh, a biases that is still in place and will still continue in the next two next uh, generations to come. And uh, uh, we still have all this data that suggests that uh, women still bear the burden of 75% uh, of uh, unpaid, unpaid care worker uh, in uh, domestic realms that uh, more uh, people in the world still think that uh, domestic uh, uh, realms is for women only. Um, and further data suggests that 50% uh, of uh, global citizens believe that, you know, w uh, children will suffer if women, uh, if, if, if mothers or women uh, work outside of their homes and, and that 70% uh, believe that domestic chores uh, uh, to be uh, given to women only. All this data suggests a very uh, grim outlook and uh, the gender pay gap and all that. Um, so the question is, what do we do to address this? In developed world, I think uh, even though there is still a gender uh, imbalances, but the situation is not as uh, serious as in developing countries. Uh, in developing countries, for example, you know, women uh, have to do more work, 70, 60 percent more work than, than men, whereas in developing countries, they're probably uh, 1.5 times higher uh, uh, of women's roles in, uh, of women's uh, job in domestic uh, uh, realm. So uh, we've got uh, social norms, we've got religious norms, we've got um, uh, regulations that forbid women uh, to gain their full potential in, in the community. So uh, I think we've got a huge task ahead of us. First, course, we need to straighten out the legislations. We need to come up with better regulations. We need to make sure that discriminations against women are to dealt with. Uh, and then we need to make sure that uh, uh, Women are given access to education. Women are given access to basic infrastructure. Because if women are given basic uh, access to uh, basic infrastructure such as electricity or water, then it means that they can allocate more time to a more income generating activities. Uh, we also need to create champions in life. You know, not only women champions, but also male champions that would. Uh, break down the barriers in the society. So like have here, you know, someone who's probably uh, are quite used to gender imbalances because of the, you know, uh, our reinforced biases in the society, but given uh, exposure to different way of thinking, to uh, different uh, uh, method of looking at the uh, gender issues, then develop a new way of looking at the issues. So uh, in short, we've got a lot ahead of us you know, that we need to do. The CIGI remains a, uh, a baseline that we need to use as a way to measure uh, a, a country's uh, 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 willingness to engage it fully in uh, in, in women's, uh, in, in, in gender uh, equality. And so that's where we have to start, I think, with, with uh, metrics, with, with uh, data, and then come up with uh, the proper legislations, and then also with approaches, cultural and, and, and religious approaches as well.
Thank you. Uh, we know that uh, among the obstacles, um, there are some cultural uh, barriers. And um, I want to, to, to ask uh, Mirene, um, I know that the Foundation Channel has been studying, for example, the, 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 the number of women working in South Korea. And it's quite strange because South Korea, in everybody thinks it's a very developed country in terms of working. And um, only 56% of women in South Korea on are on the labor market. And the wage gap is 37%. So, um, obviously, there are some cultural barriers. So, what are your views on how culture prevents women to join the work labor? Thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, contribute to this interesting panel on women, the economy, and possibly their contribution also to a peaceful society. Uh, I, I want to advocate as... Um, not only a private foundation, but as a former development worker, for the fact that gender equality, first and foremost, is a universal matter. We've heard it from, from you and uh, from many other actors. There's no country that has achieved gender equality so far. So what you point uh, towards when looking at one particular example in South Korea is true in many other countries on other aspects. And for that purpose, I think um, putting a gender lens on every single contribution to development and peace uh, building and economic development is one of the positive ways to ensure that we're building uh, inclusive societies. That being said, um, the way we approach it at Fondation Chanel is to build a life cycle approach for girls and women, starting obviously from youth onwards, uh, looking at not only the uh, structural barriers, but also the mental barriers that can uh, lay, uh, lay more uh, vulnerability and uh, create a difficulty for women to achieve their full potential. Uh, not only do we look at it from a life cycle uh, approach, but also from an integrated perspective, looking at all the different facets of a woman's life, uh, both in the family, outside the family, in the public space as a, a, a contributor to uh, the thought leadership in academia, in science, and in other environments today. We will talk more about that later. So to your point on South Korea, uh, one very important point here is that it's not so much that the economic growth of the country has been hindering women to access jobs. Mm -hmm. They have access. They actually have one of the highest uh, higher education rates in the world. Um, so they're fully educated, extremely um, powerful in the sense of knowledge. But why is it that they don't experience a full uh, capacity in the workplace? Uh, there are many reasons for that, and a study that we conducted recently with the Asia Foundation went a little bit in further detail uh, on, on those uh, limitations. And they, those include, of course, social norms around uh, marriage, uh, and the fact that uh, the role of women in uh, this particular country, but in many others, is to remain at home once the first child is born. And more structurally, the workplaces are not friendly enough for new mothers to return. So one of the programs that we are supporting in South Korea precisely looks at entrepreneurship of women as an alternative to going back to a salaried work after uh, going into the different stages of life through motherhood, etc. But there are many, many factors that can hinder the access to uh, new jobs, better paying jobs, uh, reigniting also the uh, intention from politicians all the way to uh, heads of, st heads of uh, companies and all the way to heads of universities and schools to making sure that they induce the encouragement from day one for girls to know that they can do anything in life. Thank you. Um, it's true that uh, there are all kinds of uh, barriers and um, sometimes the laws in themselves can be discriminatory. Hervé, do you want to? Yes, Karin, Th thank you very much for inviting me to this panel, and I'm used to being minority on those subjects, but uh, if anything, the value of this discussion actually gives me a lot of hope that, you know, we're making good progress. Um, I actually just want to mention one report, um, which I really find insightful. It's a report from the, the World Bank, and I very, very much encourage you to actually have a read through it, just like the, the, very, the, the five first, first pages. 
Um, it's a report which is published annually, and it's called Women, Business, and the Law. And they actually look at um, the legislation across the world and uh, with eight key indicators and then putting the, like very good questions, they actually s ask people whether you know there's discrimination and what do we do about it. Um, I mean, and we, we know that you know the law is not the only element to gender equality, but what if the law is in itself a discrimination point? Okay. Um, so with that, with that metrics in mind, um, there's, there's something interesting in the last report. It actually says that out of the, the questions that were, were asked to um, and investigated in that report, there are only six countries in the world where, at least at the level of the legislation, you have equality. Six countries in the world. And those countries are Belgium, France, Denmark, Latvia, Luxembourg, and Sweden. Okay. These are the only, qu the only qu uh, countries in the world where you have equality in terms of legislation. Um, now, I'm ob ob obviously based in France, and we have a, a law firm with, a, a, on average, 300 people. We um, hire more women than we hire men, uh, on average 55%. And the more we grow, the more we actually lose them. This is how we came about sitting down with my partners and say, there's something wrong here. What is it that we're not doing? And we're starting to look at our, our own ways to do business, but also um, we very, you know, very quickly understood that we needed to go beyond that. Okay? So we looked at the various legislations and tried to see where is it that we can go a little bit beyond. It can be on parental leave. It can be on you know, springboard. And you, you mentioned one point which is extremely important. Um, how do you get the men to participate in those discussions? So what we do, for example... M maybe we'll, yeah. we'll come sure. to, to, to that to, uh, later. And so w we are still, I mean, discussing what prevent women to join the, the labor market. And in a second time, we will see what we can do to sure. uh, improve the situation. So sure. what, what prevents them? Just one, one word, and I'll, I'll stop there. What prevents them is um, unconscious bias. There's a lot of unconscious bias, but also a number of concrete problematics that are not tackled by the, the companies. And I can talk, talk to that uh, in more details if you want me to. Okay, thank you. So um, among the obstacles, so cultural, society, uh, religious uh, factors can uh, explain why, but we know that access to education and training, we know that access to funds is more difficult for women, Digitalization can be an obstacle, can be an opportunity. Uh, the balance, uh, work life, private life, child care. So, um, and then you can add what I would call soft obstacles, which are not really soft, but anyway, like stereotypes, bias, and uh, lack of role model. Um, so I, I, I want to, to, to um, ask Marietta, um, even in Europe, uh, women are still facing some challenges. So women access to the work market is not only an issue in uh, less developed countries. It's also an issue in Europe. So um, you have developed a, a gender uh, plan. Can you uh, talk about what, in your opinion, are still the obstacles in Europe? Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting the uh, European Commission. As uh, you said, uh, I'm working in development and international cooperation, and clearly the gender equality is a core value for the European Union, but it's also uh, enshrined as a priority in our external action. Uh, therefore, <coughs> I would like to stress, first of all, <coughs> that there will be no sustainable development if there uh, is a half of the population outside of the uh, equity. So therefore, we work uh, very, very hard uh, in Europe and in our external action actually to ensure and to do our best to bring the gender equality uh, very high on the agenda. We have it enshrined in the treaties of the European Union. We have it in the global strategy 
consensus for development, but also most importantly, we have it in the Gender Action Plan, where it says that 85% of all our actions needs to be gender sensitive, meaning that we cannot start any new action if it's not gender sensitive. More than that, in even in the new financial perspective, meaning the 2001-2027, uh, in our regulation called NDICI, we will have a mandatory target of 85% gender sensitive. So I can only tell you that, for example, in our external action in 2000, uh, 18, we spent 15 billion on the gender sensitive action, and uh, we are going to uh, do the, the same in, in the future. So, what are the barriers we've been talking about? There are regulatory, there are cultural, there uh, is a need to change the mindset. Basically, uh, we need to start by challenging and changing discriminatory social norm and gender stereotypes. I do agree that they uh, also uh, uh, in, exist in Europe because it's, it's difficult to get from the harmful practices, but uh, I would say that uh, the uh, barrier and the tackling the barrier limiting women's participation in economy, meaning regulatory and cultural, is a part of the creating enabling environment for business and conductive climate for investment. And we need investment. And we need to include uh, women in the workplace. Uh, in the study that was conducted, and they asked the women, uh, they, uh, 70 percent of women asked uh, replied that if they have had a choice to do the paid work they would do it so i would say there is no lack of women's willingness to participate in the la labor force but it is a lack of opportunity so what we really need to do we need to uh, find and tackle the barriers and create the opportunities for women to participate, and that means, of course, starting with uh, education, access to education. We have enormous amount of educational programs uh, globally and at the European level uh, to bring uh, girls to school, so books before babies. I can just tell you that, for example, if girls in sub-Saharan Africa would finish the secondary uh, education, there would be 65% less fourth and child marriages. So that is kind of uh, numbers we are talking about. So access to uh, education, access to health, also sexual and reproductive uh, health and rights needs to be tackled. But then, I mean, again, when you finish the school, as my president of the commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, said yesterday, I mean, you can finish the law school, but then if you don't have opportunity to find a job, I mean, that is the real tragedy. So we need to do it through the life cycle, as you said, and basically create the uh, infrastructure, meaning from childcare to infrastructure, transport, energy, water, and other facilitation in order to uh, basically um, uh, enable women to participate fully in the economy. And you have already uh, expressed the number that uh, we can go up to 28 trillion per year globally if you include uh, a female part of the pop world population in the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I, I would like to um, ask you and, and Hervé um, about uh, the lack of leadership. Um, we know that often uh, uh, women lack this leadership to fully uh, participate uh, into the, the economic market. And uh, maybe, uh, Miren, uh, I know that the Fondation Canal has been working a lot on uh, improving the leadership. And uh, you have some programs where you've been working with teenagers in the US, uh, especially Tribal One, just to include the image of women. So can you talk a little bit about uh, what you observe about you know, role model uh, kind of um, this kind of stuff? I, I believe indeed this is one of the um, added values of our foundation that bears the name of a large luxury brand. That doesn't necessarily mean that uh, beauty or 
fashion needs to be a, a standard in any way. It's much more the inspiration to build uh, strength and inner strength as much as uh, self-confidence. And so one of the key areas of focus that we've developed through programs uh, around the world uh, is um, to work on leadership and decision making. And that can be run through soft skills training, life, uh, life skills training as well, which is becoming more assertive, learning to build coalitions, even to just regroup. We noticed that one of the key factors of fragility of women worldwide is that they single out. They work on their own, they're uh, isolated in their homes, and uh, just through building the uh, opportunity to associate, to work in groups, to build cooperatives, when we're speaking of uh, women farmers, for example, uh, makes a huge difference in their um, leverage and power. So the soft skills cannot be dissociated from uh, access to the infrastructure or uh, even the basic skills that we're, we're looking at, education and, and information around healthcare and, and so on. Um, in, in the field of economic um, empowerment, what I would like to stress is that for girls to feel that they are not only welcome in the workplace and women who reintegrate the workplace at any stage of life for that matter, because many uh, women in other levels of, of their life might need to go back to paid work uh, for, for many reasons. Uh, the fact that they would w feel not only appreciated and welcome, but also uh, the, the, the talents that they bring. And I would like to stress one example, uh, maybe more from Spain than from the United States, because I know that programs were having been there just a month ago, uh, around women who have uh, suffered domestic violence. There's a wonderful program in Madrid that showcases that um, even if a person has uh, gone through uh, terrible uh, suffering through domestic violence, there is an, a, a capacity, a resilient capacity that in fact needs to be showcased further and that has added value in the workplace as well. And so uh, in many occasions we tend to provide um, survivors with low paying jobs or undignifying jobs, uh, whereas in fact what this lady has done in, in, in Spain is encourage companies to hire them as um, uh, commercial drivers, as salesperson because in fact they have amazing inner strength. Uh, so this is just an illustration to say, of course, there's a reconstruction phase, but in any given environment, we need to work on deconstructing the gender stereotypes that hold women back. And these, of course, are built into childhood, social norms, cultural and religious uh, approaches that uh, just bring the limitations and, and, and forbid them also to be expressed within uh, leadership positions, and it's my final point. Not only do we need the legislation that allows for full participation, but we need to work with men and uh, power holders, whichever they are in fact, mainly men, to allow for bigger space for decision making and leadership of women. Um, I just add something yeah. because I fully agree with uh, what you said. And uh, also, I mean, in order to um, allow women to have uh, access to finance, to have access to market. We uh, have created external investment plan with the guarantee where the priority targets are women. So meaning that whatever kind of guarantees women can do with the whatever uh, international financial institutions, the target groups are women, their access to finance, especially on small and medium enterprises. And for example, uh, more than 400 millions of guarantee uh, is put into the female's uh, um, actions that will create 3.8 billion uh, possibilities. And we have, uh, uh, for example, programs like Nozira, which means helper. That means that our guarantee would help whatever lady in Jordan to access $500 to start the business and to sell the products and also, you know, together in conjunction with other programs like uh, Ethical Passion, where we put in put in women together in the corporate, uh, um, I would say, spirit, uh, that brings the access to market much easier and with a, a very decent and transparent and traceable value chain that brings uh, a lot of uh, uh, advantages to women. And I would just like to mention also our spotlight initiative with the UN. Uh, we have contributed 500 million to the UN in order to tackle the violence, because without tackling the violence, against women, they will not ever be able to shine. Thank you. 
Hervé, um, there was a very uh, interesting study by uh, McKinsey, and this study shows that um, in finance, uh, you have equal parity at the entry-level staff, but women account only for 19% of position in C-suite, so at the top level. But more interestingly, women do not aspire for top position. So when they were asked, 40% uh, of the men uh, were aspiring to have top positions and only 26% of women. And the reason for that are uh, usually a lack of support for women within the organization, a lack of sponsorship, a lack of network for women. So what are your views on the situation of women, especially in the financial sector? Yeah, I mean, Karin, this is so true. Um, I'm always giving this example of, um, you know, before we decide the increase of salary, I have men knocking at my door and asking me, you know, to consider them for an increase of salary where, in generally speaking, people, uh, women would just not come to knock at my door. So, you know, the, the decisions maker are on more pressure by men, actually, to think about those things. And uh, the, the way we actually try to address it is um, by having a series of, uh, of measures. One of them is uh, something we call Springboard. It's, it's one of the programs we're running where we actually have uh, female associates um, actually sitting with the female partners and discussing the issues. And those issues, you know what, they, they're not magic. We know them. You know, from you know, when you start, you're 25, and then when you retire in our firm, you're 55, 60, what are the kind of issues that we face? And we know them. You know, uh, we know it's work-life balance. We know it's questions around maternity. It's, it's, it's pay gap. It's also, um, I was talking about biases. Um, we actually found that people would tend to, go to give the most interesting work to men uh, in, in the, for whatever reason, people sometimes will say, you know, um, I just don't want that person to work over the weekend. And we're like, you know, you should not assume that that person is not available to work over the weekend. Because the more you actually reproduce that, the more people will actually, I mean, men will be more trained than women. And there will be more skills at, at a certain level of, of, of seniority. So... Essentially, what we're trying to do with others is actually sit down and pin down all those issues, and we know them. Um, I'll give you an example on gender pay gap. Uh, we used to have this bonus policy where people actually are not, um, are, well, there was a proration of the bonus during the, ma the maternity leave, uh, which is a, f some, it's a fair thing to do, right? But uh, at the end of the day, if you do that, it actually d means that when you look at the gender pay gap, there is a difference. There's a mechanical difference. So you need to tackle those issues if you want maternity no longer to be an issue. And you need the leaders of the companies, and I do speak with a number of banking clients as well. You need the, the, the top of those banks um, to actually put that as a priority, as a strategic priority. It's not an H HR issue, it's a strategic priority. So you need to write it on the walls, you need to talk about it, and you need transparency. For whatever reason, we used to believe that a number of things were quite completely secret. Uh, and I'll give you just one last example and I'll, uh, and I'll stop there. Um, when you look into the, the details, and what came out of those discussions around the, the springboard thing is, questions around miscarriage. We, we actually do lose a number of our very good candidates just because while they're trying to have kids, if they actually have a miscarriage, they actually believe they're too stressed. They just want to walk out, walk out from our firms. They walk out from the banks just because you know, they want to be in a more peaceful environment. And, and it's secret to no one that this is happening and we need to tackle it in a way or another. Thank you. Um, you're totally right. Um, I, I want now to, um, to try to answer the, the, the question, so what kind of uh, ist institutional and societal uh, change uh, we need to, to make? And um, I want to ask uh, Marietta what the institutions can do to make uh, uh, the situation improve, and then I will ask uh, Miren and uh, 
Um, and uh, Yeni, uh, what the civil society can do. And uh, lastly, Hervé, uh, what the role of the men, because I think it's key. So maybe institutions, uh, Marietta, uh, you were talking about the gender action plan. So this plan will end in 2020. So you must be in the phase of designing phase three of this plan. So what are your intakes of this plan? Did it uh, improve the situation of women in Europe? What are the results? Um, let me first clarify our gender action plan. It's uh, mainly for our development partners because in Europe we believe that uh, gender equality has been achieved at least uh, in six countries formally. But um, uh, here, I mean, as I said before, 85% uh, of all our new programs, uh, meaning new f all financing that we um, uh, that we do in the development aid, and probably you all know that Europe with the uh, member states is the largest donor, uh, around 75 billion per year in the development aid, and that means uh, that everything we do uh, should be gender sensitive. So far, we achieved the target of 70%, almost 70%, and in the Gender Action Plan 3, we are going to ensure that this uh, 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 target will be fully achieved, including uh, by the mandatory target we have in our framework financial regulation. So basically, what we are trying in our actions uh, and um, from an institutional point of view, is to do uh, and to put marker on gender and every action we do. But uh, uh, clearly uh, that means, the word empower means to encourage and support the ability to do something, to change something, to give a women the right to choose what kind of life they want to live. So basically that means that we really need to tackle discriminatory barriers and uh, that starts at the country level. Of course, it starts with the cultural shift, as you said. It has a lot with the religion stereotype. And uh, again, the most transformative change is made in, at the country level. And it's also made by women. So we need to create this enabling environment through reform and regulations, and especially with the policy and practice. So uh, again, it's not enough to have a regulatory framework or the law that tells you that uh, you don't uh, uh, that it's prohibited. To, to beat your wife, uh, uh, but then the practice, you know, uh, in practice is something completely different and uh, it's not reported or it's not prosecuted. So empowering also means that uh, supporting capacities such as uh, building of uh, the government, uh, local financial institutions, businesses and women themselves. So I said, you know, to have access to own the land, access to have a bank account, access to finance and financial uh, uh, instruments is something that can help uh, uh, at least 70% of women that would like to participate at the paid work labor. And uh, also, you know, uh, we have plenty of programs, for example, with UNDP we are doing now the training of Afghan uh, women called VET, uh, you know, together with universities in, uh, in other countries, basically to enable them to get into the workforce. Again, uh, plenty of facilities, women financial uh, facility, women in agriculture, women in garment, I mean, plenty of programs that we have in order to really make life and uh, gender parity uh, equal. But again, without the uh, support of uh, every level, meaning the national, the global, and especially local, when it comes to men changing the mindset, because let's be honest, it is uh, designed for and by men. And that comes also from the digital transformation. For example, now, if we come to that, we have only 13% of women in the digital area, uh, the sector, 
meaning that also the whole digital transformation will be designed by man. So here it comes. We need to gap, bridge the gap, not only in other sectors, to uh, allow uh, women to participate in the work force, but if we are going to talking about digital transformation and digital era, we need to ensure that women are fully, fully uh, participating in that part of uh, the future as well. That's why we designed also, uh, together with the World Bank, uh, digital to equal, meaning that we need to increase the female participation in the digital sector. So uh, that will shape our future and design our well-being for uh, many, many years to come. Thank you very much. Um, we, we made an anon anonymous uh, survey uh, where we actually did ask our people um, whether they felt there was gender inequality um, in our institution. And actually 70% of the men uh, responded that uh, there was no inequality. 70% felt that, you know, this is not an that issue. That there were no inequality. There was no inequality. 70%. They were, they were fully comfortable with that. Okay. <laughs> um, so that was the starting point. Um, then we said, okay, we need to do something about it precisely. Um, and, and the second observation is whenever we run a training, um, people just, I mean, men generally don't show up. Um, so here again, we need to look at the leaders, the head of the, the teams, to actually go around the offices and tell the men that they should go, and everyone needs to be held accountable for it. Um, it will take time. I'm quite optimistic, generally. So I believe you know, if you explain things uh, progressively, and they will happen, um, and, and, and men, you know, um, at least in a number of jurisdictions, people are happy to be to be to listen, and they need to be taught about those things. And it will take time. Um, and I was reading um, an article the other day, which says, if you want to tackle those issues, you should start with men who only have daughters. Um, they would be generally more sensitive to the question. Thank you. Um, it's true that uh, usually. Um uh, when we we talk about you know women rights, it's uh, women talking to women. Um, so my question would be to uh, Yeni and uh, Miren. Uh, when we look at your programs, they are only designed uh, to take care of women. So all your programs are about women. So why is it that you don't have any programs designed for men? And what are your interactions with men? So maybe. Uh, Yeni and then uh, Mirena. Thank you. Um, I'd like to comment on the data that you suggested, and, and uh, it's very interesting what uh, you mentioned. We actually did our own survey, uh, but in the context of my country, about the, uh, the attitude of, of uh, the society, in particular women, on particular issues. And one of them is to look at the issue of how women see, or not how, how the society sees uh, women being active uh, outside of their homes. And the data is quite surprising because it, uh, it shows that more women are actually not supportive of women being active outside. So more men are actually more supportive of women being active outside. So this means, this, this translates into more pressure from women to other women. Which means that if a woman is going to be active outside, she will face the pressure from mother-in-law, from mothers, from sisters, from best friends, and all this you know, other peer pressure. So uh, when we talk about a, a change of mindset, which you two talked about before, we also need to not just address the men, but also the women, making sure that they are, uh, uh, that they will not fall into those, the stereotypes, and that they will consciously work towards uh, a better uh, balances in, in, in society. And the second thing that we, uh, second thing that we need to do is to also to identify incentives for women to be active in the, works for, in the workforce. So the incentives are not just financial incentives, but, uh, but could be different imaginal incentives. For example, in, 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 uh, in corporate sectors that would put a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, people working long hours to gain seniority level. It is a disincentive for women 
to work in that kind of environment. Because you know, at a certain age, some women, not all women, but some women might feel that I want to have children. I want to get married and I want to have children, or I don't have to get married, but I want to have children. And that, and, and they weigh down the, the, um, uh, the incentives that they get from having a family, starting a family, and working long hours in the courtroom, in the corporate sectors, and they see that, you know, it is not, it's not good enough for me. It doesn't give me that kind of satisfa satisfaction, level of satisfaction. So, especially when you don't have the proper incentives and proper uh, structure to make sure that when women are taking the time away from work, uh, workplace, that they can still uh, catch up. You know, you need to make sure that uh, this will not provide any incentive for women to, to go back to the, uh, to the workplace. So, um, so the third thing is that we need to do is to provide access, especially for girls, to go into untraditional roles especially in the educational sector, which means you know, prodding them to go to uh, territories that uh, societies traditionally uh, think that boys should go into, like the, the STEM uh, 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 sector, the science, maths, uh, engineering, and all that. So encouraging girls mm -hmm. to, to elect more of this, to go into this kind of uh, 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 education, you know, so. Uh, I think these, these are things that we need to consciously do to achieve more uh, gender balances. But in terms of what you asked before, why do we uh, address women? Because... No, my, my question is why you don't have special programs uh, for the boys? And, and maybe, Miren, you can answer that as well. Okay, I mean, you have a lot of programs for young girls, but none of them is for young boys. And I think that we should start at the right beginning of uh, education, so can you? Uh, yeah, I, I, can I, just add I one see one the one sign. We, we have to to finish very quickly. Right. So maybe Miren, why don't you have any program designed for boys? Well, there's um, I would say a first stance in strategizing when we look at what can we do in priority. Um, of course, every single one of our programs is non-gendered. In fact, we have loads of programs that are boys and girls inclusive. Um, but what we realize is that most of the programs that are going to have an impact on mindset change, on social norms change, are those that have a strong campaigning and sensitization component. Um, and at the other uh, end of the spectrum, uh, programs that will have uh, transformative uh, service delivery, I would think of even sports for development initiatives that bring b fathers and, and their daughters together to, to do exercise in Brazil. This is a wonderful program that we're supporting with Plan. Um, but I think beyond the examples, the intention is to bridge the gap before we uh, necessarily exclude one uh, or the other. This is all about inclusivity anyways. Uh, but we are l facing a, a huge gap of, uh, as we said, leadership skills, access, um, and empowerment in general with such a wide variety of issues. I think as a you know, s s uh, foundation dedicated to uh, supporting the civil society organizations who do this work in the field. And I, I do believe that one of the key issues that we could address more strongly, and I will you know, commit to this also at the Peace Forum, is to say supporting women's organizations, women's groups, to maybe non, uh, not only to pursue their activist work, but also to work towards better inclusivity uh, at local level. I, I understood that all the different cascading effects uh, all result in local, individual, and community change. And that is where um, we're, we're hoping to build this, um, this transformation. Um, but when it comes to seeing women in the workforce, and again, why is it important not only for uh, peace in the world, because we know that when women are involved in the economy, in uh, peace negotiations, in stabilizing communities after a conflict or a crisis, things get better faster. And we are also facing the climate crisis now when we know that if girls are not and women are not involved in uh, not only re managing resources better, but also finding solutions to face the change, this is only going to be uh, going worse. Um, but my, my final idea here is uh, we often think of women in the workplace only as paid active members, 
uh, and considering them as we, we possibly would, would consider them as less involved in their work because they have family duties. My take on this is completely different. I think we, all women, are as workaholic as men. <laughs> Not only do we love to work, <laughs> but we do so much more on a day daily basis, including all the unpaid duties and all the invisible, uh, we speak in French of the charge mentale, right? Uh, mental charge of organizing other people's lives so that it is seamless. <laughs> uh, let's not forget that the economy is also run thanks to all this uh, supportive environment that women provide to others. Thank you. I think it's time uh, to answer some questions from the public. So it's uh, time if you have any question. Yes, sir. Um. You want me to stand up? Okay. Um, uh, thank you for all this uh, discussion. Very admirable and um, love all the activities you're talking about. Uh, you mentioned in one part of one sentence sexual and reproductive rights. And to me, that's kind of a base. Like if a woman or a girl doesn't have control over when they have children, how many children they have, kind of all this, a lot of this goes out the window. So in what way can you um, embed sexual and reproductive rights into some of the programs that you're talking about? Who wants to answer this question? Yeni, Hervé? Hi, I uh, <laughs> have a go to this. Um, obviously, within a, a company, a law firm, whatever it is, there's a limit to what you can do on those things. So the way we try to participate um, in this is we actually uh, work either on a pro bono basis or other with companies, associations who actually are quite um, active in, in, in that space. Um, but we do have an internal debate about those things. It's not only a question of working for others or just giving money out. We really need to have the debate. Um, and we did have that debate. And there was uh, one of our gentlemen, and two of my colleagues here would actually maybe know who I was talking about, who came. And, and he, this gentleman was from South, Af South America. And he came and he said very genuinely that we couldn't participate and you know promote those organizations precisely because you know he definitely was against it, and he said our company could not be seen as pursuing this. So um, I yeah, got to take him in my office and say, no, this is our organization, and whoever is not happy with it can walk. And we, if we have clients who are not happy with them, we actually take you know the risk of losing them. And he looked at me, and he was genuine. He was looking at me, and he said, are you not shocked? And I'm like, no. And he said, oh, God, you French people, how strange are you? <laughs> so if anything, the value of this is actually brought the debate on the table, and we need to bring people around the world. We are in 30 jurisdictions, and we cannot apply the same rules in all the jurisdictions. We need to have progressive debates on those things. Thank you. Any other yeah. question? Can I just answer that? Sorry. Also? Yeah. Just, uh, uh, you know, I come from a, com a society in which uh, gender imbalance is so ingrained as a value as well, you know, that women accept it as, as, as given, that their, their rights are not uh, to be awarded to them. So what we, need to, what we do is we try to challenge this, uh, this mentality and build awareness, especially on the community level and the grassroots level. We've got a, a program called Peace Village Initiative, which combines economic uh, empowerment and then peace building mechanism, women empowerment, as well as adding uh, the issue of climate change, awareness about climate change into the fray. So combining all of this together to create a more uh, 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 holistic approach in, in the way women see their, their roles in the society, including building awareness on sexual and reproductive health, and uh, including pointing the ways for them to get access to birth controls, for example. So simple things like that. But the main thing is to build awareness first about that. Hello, my name is Maria Sanchez and I work for the European Commission and my question is addressed to the private sector. Um, I'm a lawyer by training and I'm a woman 
And um, could you tell me that a woman around her 30s, in the middle 25, 30s, that you know that is uh, just, just trying to join your office or a private company, you, besides what the general approach of your company, so the legislative framework of your companies, there will be absolutely no issue in hiring her, knowing that she could get pregnant any minute, that she could have uh, uh, difficulties trying to uh, have a work-life balance with the very, very and extremely uh, tight schedules of, of, of the private sector. Um, do you think that that would not be an issue? And I'm not talking about what your uh, legislation says, what your normative framework says. Could you confirm that over a man that has exactly the same uh, requirements, that would not be an issue for her? Because this is where we have to start. Um, again, I, yeah, I'm happy to, to start on this one. <coughs> and again, I can only speak about you know, what is in my strategy for my firm. Um, I keep repeating to everyone, maternity should not be an issue. You know why? Because it's only so far women who can have children. There's no way around it. There's, it we know it will happen again. You know, mm. When we sit down and we pinpoint the, the issue, it will happen at some point. And we do want that to happen. Okay, um, so we keep repeating to people, yes, statistically we know X percent um, people will be pregnant over the years and it should not be a problem. We need more role models and, and again, actually, I, I, I have two daughters and I would hate people not hiring them for this and if it happens, it's a very good news. I'll go a little bit beyond that just to explain. Um, we actually do say, and we wrote it on the walls, and it's part of the strategy to say, whenever someone is uh, in maternity, is going to maternity, about to go in maternity, we will just discard, you know, the business level as we call it, because well, I mean, we lawyers will be by the hours. We just say two months before the maternity, and two months after, we ju just don't take those months into account, and it's in our budget. Okay, we are a low, large law firm, we can support that, that's right. For smaller companies, it's more difficult. But it is my role, it is the role of some of my partners to actually say to, you know, to, my, to my partners, look how efficient they can be. Why is it that, you know, generally speaking, they would be more efficient at the start of their career and we're losing them along the way. So if we don't kind of address all those issues, we will just keep losing them. And I agree with you, from time to time, it's, it's difficult. Of course it is. And I, I have those discussions with clients as well. I'm like, when we have those discussions where you, we, you know, you're current encouraging us to do it, but you are the ones who are, you know, will send some work to us on Friday and ask for it to be delivered on Monday morning, and someone has to do it. So I turn to the women and I say, I'm happy to hire you. It's a difficult job. We need to train the entire team so that people support you. But what I cannot do are two things. One is I cannot ask clients to be you know, less demanding, and I cannot support you if your husband is not happy with it. But what I can support you with is my organization to tell you this is not an issue. But in practice, do you have uh, lots of father who are taking paternity leave? We do have that, and as a matter of fact, thanks for asking the question. We expanded. Uh, we decided in July to expand the. Uh, we we actually call it parental leave, not paternity leave, obviously for for obvious reasons. Um, and it used to be 14 days, and we actually expanded it now. Uh, it used to be, sorry, it used to be uh, 11 days and we have now expanded it. And the reason why we want to do it um, is precisely that people feel completely, um, you know, comfortable around that. And we have that objective that in 2021, all the fathers, uh, so to speak, will have taken their, their parental leave. Do you know how many days they can take in Sweden? Sweden was, I can't remember, it's huge. I, I saw the... 480 yeah, days I saw that. of I saw parental that. leave. Yeah, so I saw that, yeah. And, 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 and I think that... Just make a comment on that, you know. I have a problem with that. Uh, 
way of thinking, which is putting the burden on women to face the problem alone. It's, you know, I cannot help you if your husband is not being supportive. I cannot help you if the client is demanding, blah, blah, blah. But it's not giving a support to women. You know, we all know that the society needs change uh, and it's time to progress. It will take time, maybe 100 years. And, you know, women today cannot wait for their 100 years to get the support that they need today. So, you know, we need to come up with a better system, with a better mechanism that women can feel that, yes, I can dedicate myself to my family as well as being productive in the workplace, that I'm not going to be, uh, to be skipped over when there's a promotion in my workplace. So we need to provide more support for women. And it's not, it's not enough just saying that, hey, you're on your own. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if I can add just one word to this, you, I think you're perfectly right, um, and, and we need to work on uh, on various initiatives. Um, we have what a program called iFlex, where actually people can work from home one day a week, and we have introduced a new rule whereby people, you know, about to go on maternity, and when they they, they about when they return for a given period of time, they can work two days from home. Um, we have a training from, for the team where someone becomes pregnant. We actually get all the team together and say, this is the, these are the issues that people will be facing, and we, knew, we need you to support them in X and Y's uh, way, and if you need more, just come to us. The, the, why, the reason I was saying this is the limit, uh, I actually had that discussion with one of my researchers. She was absolutely excellent. She had a, a baby, and... Ten months after that, she came back. She came back in my office and said that she was pregnant again. And and I said, well, it's it's not an issue. It's a good thing. And then she, when she delivered the baby, she she worked for six months and said, I'm resigning. Not that you're not helpful. Not that the, the company is not helpful. And she just said, it's my husband who is about to leave me. And this is where I actually said, I can't help you with that. What I can help you with is give you a part time job. I can give you more time. I can get people to help you, but if you have an issue with your husband, and maybe that was not the right thing to say, you know, there's a limit to what I can do. That's, that's what I wanted to express. Evie, thank you very much. I think that uh, the time is over. Uh, maybe uh, one last word? <coughs> if you allow me, just the last word. Um, next year, here in Paris, we will have a huge event uh, celebrating 25 years of Beijing Declaration. Yes. And I would like all of us, and uh, of course uh, the majority of the audience is female here, but I would flex for everyone really to work towards uh, this very important event uh, for the gender equality, but not only 25 years later that the Beijing Declaration would be implemented, because sometimes we have doubts that today this kind of declaration could be uh, adopted in the form that we had 25 years ago. So let's work together that we will not go backwards instead of forwards. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Ça sera le mot de la fin. Merci pour votre participation.